Welcome to this knowledge clip on sources, the law of treaties. In this clip we will discuss why we deal with the law of treaties, what it arranges exactly, uh, we will look into the system, uh, we will look at when you can use the VCLT and we will go into some rules. First of course the question what is the law of treaties? So if you have a problem as a state uh, surrounding um, the use of a treaty, then you refer to the law of treaties. And you can compare it a bit in private law to contract law. So what does it then arrange? Um, for example, the entry into force of a treaty, um, giving consent to be bound by a treaty, making reservations to a treaty, the interpretation of certain articles in a treaty, and also, naturally, the ending of a treaty. So the system, how does it work? It's quite straightforward. You first check the treaty that you have a question about. So if you are working on a case dealing with the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court, you will look into the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court to see if it gives you an answer to your question. If you cannot find an answer to your question, you will look into the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. The Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, or the VCLT, was adopted at the Vienna Conference, of which you see a picture here. The Vienna Conference uh, um, was codifying a customary international law on treaty law. So the VCLT contains, to a large extent, but not entirely, in codified customary international law. So when can you use the VCLT? The first couple of articles uh, gives you an, give you an idea on when you can use the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. For example, that it actually must concern a treaty that you're dealing with, um, closed between more than one state. These things seem quite straightforward. But also remember that the VCLT can only be applied to states which are actually a state party to the VCLT. So if the VCLT has not entered into force yet or is not ratified by a certain state, you cannot use it. Is that a problem? Not exactly, because as said, most um, provisions of the VCLT are customary law. So then um, you would refer, as a lawyer, not to the VCLT, but the rules stemming from customary law. In this course, however, we just depart from the assumption that in the cases that you will see, you can use the VCLT. So first, we will just look into some of the topics. The entry into force of a treaty. If you are wondering whether a treaty already entered into force or not, um, the general rule says that a treaty entered into force um, after all states that participated in negotiations gave their consent to the treaty. And how can you give your consent? Um, you can do that, for example, through signature. And in the pictures here you see three former US presidents and three uh, Russian presidents who signed treaties. And signing a treaty is just giving your signature to it. Ratification is usually uh, the required act for giving consent. And through ratification you actually obtain the permission of usually Parliament to become a party to a treaty. So it's more of a formal act to become a party. Accession to a treaty is um, used when the state that becomes a party to a treaty or giving its consent to the treaty was not part um, of the state that negotiated the text of a treaty. So that's the state who became involved at a later stage. Um, reservations are also arranged in the VCLT. And Article 19 of the VCLT says that reservations are allowed as long as they do not violate the object and purpose of a treaty. So for example, you have the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. And a couple of states who became a party to CEDAW made the reservation that they wish, did not wish to be bound by the article that says that women could give nationality to, to their children. So that children 
could obtain a nationality through their mothers. Um, the problem, if you say that it's not possible, um, as soon as a child is born and the father is out of the picture, then the child becomes stateless. But still many states said that they do, they do not recognize this right for women to transfer nation nationality. And you can ask um, yourself whether you think that that is a violation of the object and purpose of a treaty. Interpretation, also arranged in the VCLT. So Article 31 of the VCLT says that the ordinary meaning of the words of a certain provision must be read in their context and in the light of the treaty's object and purpose. For example, there was a, a case before the European Court of Human Rights, the Tyra case. And this case was um, from 1978. Here there was a, a certain boy who was punished uh, for something he did, a criminal offense, by um, receiving three strokes on his behind. And the question was whether that would amount to degrading treatment as laid down in the European Convention of Human Rights. And the court said that maybe at the time of adoption of the European Convention, this would be acceptable but around 1978 it was no longer acceptable to punish kids in such a way. Then uh, the ending of treaties. So it can be uh, the case that a treaty is invalid from the start. And um, that happens for example when there was a certain error made, uh, fraud, uh, corruption, coercion, um, violation of parentary norms, use Kogans. But there's also the case that a treaty um, was valid for a certain time and was working for a certain time, but is terminated or suspended. And the modes of termination um, well are the following. So you first of have the, the termination where states agree that they will end a certain treaty. And that can happen just because the whole subject matter over which the treaty was concluded has ended. But there are also options where a state can unilaterally end a certain treaty. And many of these come um, in discussion in the case of Hungary versus Slovakia that was prescribed for this course. So one of these is the material breach. So when one uh, treaty partner would violate its obligations to a certain uh, serious extent, then that would give floor to the others to also um, end their obligations in that treaty. It is also possible um, that later events make that, um, that the treaty is no longer relevant. And that is determination by supervening events. So if you have an agreement over the use of a river, but the river runs dry, then there's no use to have that treaty anymore. And there's also the escape uh, of the fundamental change of circumstances. Um, states would like to use that quite a bit, that they would argue that circumstances has changed um, to such a dramatic point that they would no longer be bound by the treaty. However, this is by the ICJ not easily granted uh, because it leads to much misuse. 